And we are live with today's pre-show. This is our 2201102 A-plus study group, our core two, as we like to call it, as CompTIA likes to call it. And we are 10 minutes away from getting everything ready to go in here. We got a lot to go through today. I have uh, all new questions from the core two exam objectives. And right now I'm just making sure that recordings are going. I can see my Cylons are going here, so we're good there. Live stream looks okay. Looks all right. That's our on air light there. That's our live stream streaming device. We've got things happening here. That looks good. Hey, chat room. Hey, everybody. How you guys doing? How's everybody doing? Man, oh man, we got a lot going on. Okay, we are indeed live. Hello, Tacoma, Washington. Hello, Texas. Got folks checking in. Thanks for being here. Oh boy, we've got uh, all new questions. I should probably check those questions first, make sure everything looks okay. One never knows which version of the presentation one may be, one may be working from. In this case, I think we're in pretty good shape. We're in we're in pretty good shape. Um, man, it, I have not moved since you saw me last. I've been in this chair. <laughs> I've been I've been editing videos nonstop. Uh, just constant, constant video editing right now. There's so much going on. Other content being created, other pages, updating the website, doing these. There's just it's just constant motion. So we are we are really pleased on how things are looking right now. So we're getting there. Ah, oh, so now we get to now we get to make this happen. People checking in again, another from Washington. Thank you for being here, folks over on the West Coast. We got Fort Lauderdale, Florida's checking in. I don't know about down the street, but I guess Florida is one big street, isn't it? Isn't that the way we talk about it? Fort Lauderdale's definitely in there. As someone who spent a number of years living in Hialeah. Miami Lakes, uh, out, out in uh, Pembroke Pines, in Miramar. I moved around a lot for some reason. A lot going on there. And Fort Myers is checking in. There's Atlanta in the Philippines, New Hampshire. Hampshire, sorry, mis mispronounced it. Um, Atlanta again, Fairfax, Virginia. Hey, Cape Town, South Africa. Thanks for being here. Oh, okay. So all of our questions today are for Core 2, Core 2 is what we are working on at the Netherlands here, the Caribbean or Caribbean, depending on, I'm not sure what it depends on. It's one of those two things on whether it is a, an attraction at Disney or not, I guess. Pirates of the Caribbean is how I always hear it. But when I talk about the Caribbean, I always pronounce it that way. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the difference is. I don't know if it's regional. I don't know if it's, just the way it is. Some someone will tell me. I'm sure. Hello, Illinois. It's not how you pronounce it. That's okay. Illinois here. Thanks for being here. Oh, we've got uh, a busy weekend ahead of us too, because it's just going to be me in this dark room uh, editing a bunch of video. That's that's the details. Now you know my life. That's it. That's all I'm doing this weekend. <laughs> during the during the times when I am in here. Uh, we are good. So we've, we're, we've just got so many videos to edit. Um, I've already shot all of my Security Plus videos that are coming out. And now I've, they're just all on SSD. And it's now just me going through every single one of them and editing them. And as you know, I've already forgotten what I said when I shot them, which that's not unusual. The, the unusual part is that uh, when, whenever I go to deal with all of the things associated with editing this, uh, the funny part is how many times I've made a mistake and I have to edit around the mistake. Uh, it's just one after the other. I, I, and I think, did I make that many mistakes the first time through? I, I obviously did. It's, it's on video. Uh, but it, I don't remember that. I don't recall those that particular instance or why that happened that way. But there you go. That's that's sort of normal for me. You never get to see those. I edit out all of those. 
I've only had to go back and do a voiceover. Sometimes I will have to change what I say. Sometimes I will be doing a video and I'll be talking about an exploit and I'll call it a vulnerability, just sort of in passing. And I don't even recall it. But when I'm editing, I'm listening going, why did I call that a vulnerability? That's clearly an exploit. And so I, what I end up doing is re-recording the audio and just layering it on top. So I'm using the same you know, audio stream here. So it doesn't sound any different when you're watching the video. But if you look closely at certain spots, the mouth is not saying what the audio is doing. That's very rare that I would have to do that. Prob probably rare because I'm doing so many takes that I end up having to, I can, I can splice them together in a lot of different ways. Sometimes I'll take an, a word from here and bring it over and put it there. It's, that takes a long time. It's so much easier when I can just talk to the content, give you a demo, and it's all contiguous and correct, and I can put it all together, and it, it works fine. Whenever you have to start re-recording things or splicing from another place, it just takes so much more time that we don't have. Because ultimately, I think we posted just over 30 videos there's more that have been done, but I uh, ultimately the entire course is going to be about 120 videos. So that's how it works. See, it is. It's all pre-recorded. It's all a hoax. It's all. Yeah, it's all me. I, I'm not even here talking right now. It's all AI. That's exactly what it is. Ah, that made me laugh a little bit. The VVox code. I guess I can give it to you. Nope, that's not the VVox code. Let's give you this code here. There you go. There's your VBOX code for today. It's 155-928-224. You can always find the VBOX code by going there, professormesser.com slash QA. And the in the URL or in the page that suddenly is shown is this page you're seeing on the screen. So it's easy to find it. That That is one that I would like to have different, different links depending on the study group. So I'd love it if you were able to go to professormesser.com slash core one, core two. Net plus security, you know, those types of things. But that's that's what I have to work on next. That's my next big project is getting all of those things done. We'll see how that works out. That probably is something that will happen after the beginning of the year. I don't know if we're going to stay on VVox. There are, there are idiosyncrasies of VVox that I am not happy with. I wouldn't say not happy, that I wish were better. Uh, VVox overall works great, but there's just little things that I wish were different. Uh, I would like you to be able to submit questions anytime before the study group, not just during the study group. So it's one of those that I would like to add on. There's some services I can do that are very similar to this, and they will allow me to do that, but they cost more money. That's, that's it. And I cannot reuse the code on VVox. That's one of the things. That's one of the many things. That's why I end up having to put a separate URL that I update every time we do a live stream. So I'm going into my website and changing that every single time. Uh, no, Kahoot is not even, not even close to doing what we're doing here. So not even remotely close to what we're at. And I've looked at all of them. I've, <laughs> I've gone through all of them. And Kahoot is a, 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 it's back there. It's not even in the top 10 of sites that meet our requirements. It's way down there way down there. Uh, so I have, I'm very picky. I'm, so that's, that's the problem. Once we, once we really peel this onion, we're realizing, oh, wait, it's, uh, he's asking for things that are ridiculous. But there are companies that provide me with the ridiculous part. They just tell me that it costs money. And that's, that's the nature of the way it works, right? Sort of how all of these work. Okay. We got less than a minute left in the pre-show. I think we're in pretty good shape. Audio looks good. Why is the audio peaking? No, it's okay. Audio is all right. I think I'm fine with the audio. Test, 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 test. It's like I can almost go off the top of that. I'm not really happy about that. But if it doesn't, if it's not peaking on your side and it is not, then, then I'm fine. There's Canada. See, we had folks check in from Canada. Thanks for being here. Um. But we got about 10 seconds until we get started. I guess I should make sure that the presentation works. There we go. It's got a green light. It did work. That's not the slide I wanted. That's better. 
I think we are in pretty good shape then. Are we, did we hit the top of the hour? We sure did. That means it's time for a live stream, everybody. Why don't we do this? Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the November 2023 Professor Messer S. No, it's the 220-1102 Core 2 A Plus Study Group. We have so many study groups. You always have to come back and find out which one we're doing, just like I do. I'm James Messer. I'll be your host for this first hour of Q&A, where I will ask you questions that come directly from the CompTIA Core 2 A Plus exam objectives. And in the second hour, well, I'll also be your host, and you will ask me questions in the second hour. We like to call that second hour our after show. It's really the second part of our show. So we have a way to get through all of those different things. We would love it today if you could join us online while we answer these questions. If you are indeed here live, you're able to participate online. Simply pop open a new browser window and visit professormesser.com slash QA. You can also go to the VVox app. There's a VVox app in your favorite app store. VVox is the service that we are currently using to provide this functionality. And in VVox, there will be a number there that you will need to put in. That number is on the screen that you can see here. It's VVox.app. The ID today is 155-928-224. That number again, 155-928-224. Call now. Operators are standing by. Well, I've got a lot to go through today. Now, if you're in VVox and you're able to put in those IDs or you go to professormesser.com slash QA, I want to put a question up that you will be able to answer. So let's pop open one. This is what we call our rewind question because it is a question from last month's study group. So if you were here last month, you might remember this one. If you were not here last month, it's a, it's a new question for you. This question asks, an attacker has obtained the session key of a victim by sending a malicious link in an email message. Which of the following would best describe this attack type? And as always, of course, please no answering in the chat room. You want to answer using the links on your screen, either professormesser.com slash QA or the vvox.app link. The possible answers are brute force, denial of service, end of service life, cross-site scripting, or tailgating. So hopefully you can tell me which attack type best fits that particular scenario. We will come back to this question in just a moment. Lock that in. See if you get the VVox working. And again, please, no answers in the chat room. We have uh, so many things to talk about in this study group. Before we get started, I'll remind you that we have our YouTube channel. I was talking about it in the pre-show. I would love it if you were someone who wanted to see all the latest videos that we were creating. Uh, if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can visit it at professormesser.com slash YouTube. It's also where you should go to find all of our training videos. We put every video out there, every minute of every video. Nothing is held back. Nothing's behind a paywall. You don't have to register you simply visit our YouTube channel, professormesser.com slash YouTube. We also have daily A-plus pop quiz questions. They are available on Twitter. They are available on Instagram. You can visit that at professormesser.com slash Twitter slash Instagram. I know that Twitter has a different name, but not to me, apparently, yet. I'll, I'll figure it out eventually. We also have, if you're on LinkedIn, there's a professormesser.com slash LinkedIn where you can see those questions. So lots to go through there and a great place to find us online. Today, we are going to be talking about what we are doing with the 2201102. A 2201102 message, uh, the release date for the 1102 exam was April the 20th of 2022. And I think the details here uh, are that the important part, at least for us today, is that this is not going to retire until November of 2025. So you have plenty of time to study for your core one and core two exams to be able to pass both of those exams. The exams themselves are 90 minutes. If you're taking the 2201102, you on a scale from 100 to 900, you need to score a 700. And if that seems like an odd grading scale, you would be right. That is an odd grading scale. I think that's something very specific to CompTIA. Uh, once you pass both of those exams, your certification is good for three years. 
And you can, re of course, renew it. Many people do. It's not very difficult to renew your certification and continue another three-year cycle after that. You do not have to take the exams again to renew your certification, thankfully. So if you want to learn more about what's on the exam, we will be talking about these objectives throughout the session today. You can download them for free from CompTIA. I have a link to the CompTIA site that you can find at professormesser.com slash objectives. Also let you know that we have the core two, uh, the topics, the domains, as CompTIA calls them, that we will be discussing today. There will be questions today that come from operating systems, security, software troubleshooting, and operational procedures. We'll step through all of those today. I'm sure we'll get through all of them at some point. We'll do more than four questions, so I would hope we would get through more than four of them. There is an audio replay of this available uh, usually about a day after. I publish this in podcast format so that you can use your podcast listening program to always automatically download the latest version of our study groups. They're available if you'd like a link to the podcast at professormesser.com slash podcast. I have links there for my A plus network plus and security plus study groups. There's also a video replay available immediately afterwards on YouTube. That video replay currently doesn't have any timestamps. Well, because we haven't actually done this video yet. There's a whole time problem there, isn't there? But about a day later, my marketing manager, Lori, who's watching this on the replay, hey, Lori, how's everything going? She's uh, going to look at everything that we're doing, probably watching at 2x speed, and she puts in all of these timestamps in the YouTube description. Uh, this will allow you to find exactly what you're looking for for any of our live streams at any time. It's a great way to find exactly what you might be looking for. Thank you, Lori, for doing that. We also, uh, when we are not here live, have our chat room. And our chat room is on Discord. We are there all the time. Well, not all the time, but somebody's usually there all the time. This is 24 by 7. Anyone on the internet can join. It is completely open. And we have a great community there. If you're studying for your A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus, or you just want to talk to a bunch of tech heads like me, you can visit our Discord at professormesser.com slash Discord. Also let you know that eventually you'll probably want to take your A-plus exam. I'm guessing you will. And in that case, you'll need to purchase an exam setting. But to do that, you can go to the CompTIA website and certainly pay full price. But why would you do that when I have discounted vouchers available on my site right now? You don't need a coupon code. You don't need to install an extension into your browser. You simply go to professormesser.com slash voucher if you are in the U.S., Canada, or a U.S. territory, and you can purchase discounted vouchers for any of the CompTIA vouchers and exams. There's also more that you get, because if you come to my website and you're nice enough to purchase a voucher from me, I'll give you something that no one else will give you, which is a copy of my Exam Hacks ebook. This is my exclusive ebook. You can only get this ebook if you purchase my success bundle or you purchase a voucher. I don't sell them separately. So this is the only way to get your hands on the Exam Hacks ebook. This has a list of all of the tips and tricks that I've accumulated throughout the years of the many exams that I've taken in this industry. And it might give you an idea of how you might improve your score either before and in some cases during the exam itself. Just something else that I like to add in there for free. And you get that automatically when you purchase from my site at professormesser.com slash vouchers. Also have this uh, this question I asked earlier. So we, we asked this question that asked, an attacker has obtained the session key of a victim by sending a malicious link in an email message. Which of the following would best describe this attack type? Is it brute force, denial of service, end of service life, cross-site scripting, or tailgating? Let's see what you answered for this one. We'll stop the poll, and it says that 75% of us say it is cross-site scripting. That is the right answer by far. It is not as many people as answered last month, so I think we may have learned something from last month's study group, which makes me very happy. But that is the correct answer, cross-site scripting. Uh, cross-site scripting is a way that uh, that attackers like to use to be able to gain access to data using you and your browser as a way to do that. They accomplish this by 
usually sending you some or getting a script, a link to a script in some type of communication to you, usually an email, a text message, putting, putting it somewhere where you will click on it. It will then click and visit a legitimate website, one that prob you probably have access to. That's the whole idea behind this. And it loads up uh, with malicious scripting to be able to send information such as your session key back to the attacker. And so this is a very easy way that attackers can take advantage of poorly written browsers or apps on your machine and be able to gain access to data that normally they should not have access to. This cross-site scripting is an exceptional way uh, to make that happen, a very common exploit, a very common uh, application vulnerability to be able to exploit. It, it's one where... Um, and it is listed in the CompTIA exam objectives, so make sure you're aware of those. There are many different vulnerabilities listed in those exam objectives. Make sure you're familiar with them and some of the things that would be associated with them. Brute force is commonly associated with finding or um, a, a password or some other value by going through every possible combination of what that might be. Good way to find a, a, a decryption key, for example. You've got tailgating, which refers to someone coming in behind someone else into a facility, and that person would be unauthorized. So that's a physical attack would be tailgating. And then we have denial of service, which, of course, brings down systems, makes them unavailable. And then an end of service life, which nobody chose in this case. End of service life means that that particular device or thing is no longer supported by the manufacturer. So that is our rewind question of the month. We did so well this month with remembering that it was indeed cross-site scripting. And even if you didn't know what cross-site scripting was, maybe you've never heard of it, you're not familiar with it, it doesn't ring a bell for you, you probably know brute force, denial of service, end of service life, or tailgating, and then you can simply remove those from the list and the only thing left is cross-site scripting. That would be the answer that you can choose in that particular case. That is the answer here that would best describe that particular attack type. So hopefully that gives you a perspective of things you should know. Let's now change this up a little bit because one of the things that we find is that in this particular case, you could have just guessed and you could have gotten, gotten that answer right. You had a 20% chance of getting this one correct, even if you didn't know what the answer was. Well, CompTIA knows this, and they don't want to make it that easy for you. So when you start your exam, there will be a handful of questions at the beginning of your exam that are not multiple choice. It's not the entire exam, thankfully. It's just a handful, three to five, maybe six questions, maybe more, maybe less. Those questions are anything but multiple choice. They might be fill in the blank. They might put you at a command prompt and ask you to perform a function. There might be a matching question. It might be a drag and drop question. There's so many different ways to ask this information. But everything they're asking you comes directly from the exam objectives. So don't worry about how they're asking these questions. If you know the content, if you know what's in the exam objectives, you should easily be able to answer these performance-based questions. And I have for you, as I do with every study group, the first new question is a performance-based question. So I have one for you today. And although we will not be typing things into a command prompt, the question is asking you about typing things into a command prompt because it asks, from the command line, display the Windows About screen containing the OS build number of the local system. So we have to know if we're typing something in at that, that view right there, what is the thing that we are typing in to be able to display the Windows About screen containing the OS build number of the local system? If you think you know the answer, I've put uh, that into your VVox app. You can use the link at the bottom of your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, and you can type in what you think the answer is. Uh, this is, and I'm watching as people are typing this in, bringing these through and being able to see what the different options are. Uh, and many of you know this one solid. I think we've got a very good number of you that know this one. Some of you are typing in different things. Make sure you read through the question very carefully so you know exactly what is being asked of you. And of course, as always, we want to be able to use these questions 
and answer them online using the link professormesser.com slash QA. That's the link down here at the bottom of your screen. That will give you an option to put those. Please don't answer in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We want to see if we can do this all by ourselves. This is also something that might help. It's also a command that you have to know that comes directly from the CompT exam objectives. So that, that maybe adds a little bit more information that might help you. But in reality, you should be able to type this in and know what that happens to be. See if you happen to know what it is. I'm going to watch a few more of these responses come in. We'll see what different options people are putting in. we got a lot of really great answers here, by the way. Um, and since a number of you have locked in your answer already, I am going to give you an idea of what the answer happens to be. So if you are someone sitting at the command prompt and you want to know what the build number is of the operating system that you're using on the machine that's directly in front of you, and you would like, you would like to see it from the Windows About screen, which was the real key here, was the Windows About screen, then you wanted to run Winver. If you type in Winver, as I've done here at the top of my command prompt, you can see that it pops up the entire Windows About screen. Now, this, of course, is assuming that you're in front of a graphical display. You're able to use and see all of these graphical components. You're not at a command prompt and looking for information at the command prompt. As the question asked, we would like to see the Windows About screen containing the OS build number. And if you look very closely, you can see information about the version number that is here. In fact, this one happens to be, let me zoom up on it. Here we go. I'm going to do something there. So this is, I'm running uh, Windows 10 version 21H1 OS build 1903-1466. There is the answer on the Windows About screen. It says About Windows right there. And so we can really see the details of that. Now, sometimes you like to be able to view information without all of these screens popping up. Maybe you don't want that graphical screen that's there in front of you. You could type VER for version and get another grouping of version information at the command line where it doesn't pop up this box. But that wasn't the question. The question wanted you to, to provide a way to view that, that information from that Windows About box. Now, I could have made the question so that it just popped up at the command line, which would mean you would use the ver command, V-E-R. But WinVer pops open that entire Windows screen, which really gives you a little bit more information than you would get using the ver command because you've got so much real estate there on the screen. You see it's Windows. You see the version number. You've got Windows 10 at the top. You've got information about the build you're using. Plenty of details there. If you're troubleshooting, you're sitting down on a machine for the first time, you go to the command prompt and you realize, I don't even know what version of Windows is on this. Let's see if they've even updated to the latest build. Let's run WinVer and see what build version is there. So hopefully that will help you as you step through the different Different options available for Winver. That is our performance-based question of the month. And you could easily be asked to input or use any of those command line options and utilities that are listed in the CompT exam objectives. Just another example of how you should know all of them. Now, in my video, uh, which is the 2.2011.02 section 1.2, the video named Windows Command Line Tools, I take you through those commands and I give you a demonstration of this and be able to see what's there. So hopefully, this gives you an idea of things that might help you. That is our performance-based question of the month. Let's now shift gears back to a multiple choice-based question. I have one for you, and it asks, a system administrator is automating a process using PowerShell. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this automation? Is it? Back up a Linux directory, customize the contents of a web page, update certificates on a macOS device, convert rows in a spreadsheet, or restart Windows services. If you think you know the answer, please no answers in the chat room. I want you to instead go to the links on your screen, either professormesser.com slash QA, or if you have the VVox app, you can easily add in the numbers that are here, 155-928-224, and be able to answer it in the app itself. A system administrator is automating a process using PowerShell. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this automation? Is it back up a Linux directory, customize the contents of a web page, update certificates on a macOS device, 
convert rows in a spreadsheet, or restart Windows services. Uh, that's a, this is one that hopefully you're familiar with. Maybe some of you have even used PowerShell. You might have an idea of what you might be able to do with it. That will certainly help you if you get a question like this on your exam. number of you are putting in your final answers for this one. So before I click the button, let's see if we can get a couple more in there. Let's see what you think the answer is to this one. Again, the question asks, a system administrator is automating a process using PowerShell. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this automation? Back up a Linux directory, customize the contents of a web page, update certificates on a macOS device, convert rows in a spreadsheet, or restart Windows services. And if we click the button, we can see that a large number of you have chosen that last answer, which is restart Windows services. You've got 70, almost 78% of you would be able to answer that one. You think that's the correct answer. But we've got 11% that said back up a Linux directory. We've got 4% that said customize the contents of a web page. 4% also said convert rows in a spreadsheet. And we had 1% that said update certificates on a macOS device. So 20% of you chose something else. So really 22, 23. So what is the right answer? If we go with that majority of you who said restart Windows services, that was what one that was really the big answer that people chose. Windows PowerShell is a valuable scripting language. It is one that if you are you're working through understanding how to automate and script things in Windows, PowerShell should probably be the thing that you are concentrating on. A lot of uh, a lot of people who are hiring right now would like people that know how to automate. And using PowerShell is one of the most common ways to automate things on a Windows device or a Windows environment. Uh, this is included with Windows, a great functionality. And it has inside of it what we call commandlets. So uh, it allows you to run different commands. A good example are some of their, that are listed there on the screen. Uh, this is what people use to automate Windows. And one of the nice things about PowerShell that's different than simply the Windows command line, which was sort of a layover from the DOS days, is that PowerShell can talk and manipulate to, it can talk to and manipulate many aspects of the Windows operating system itself which is something you can't do with the Windows command prompt. For example, if you want to start or stop a Windows service, there's no automatic or integrated way to do that at the Windows command prompt, but it is integrated into PowerShell. So if you are a system administrator for Windows systems, you better get very, very familiar with PowerShell, not only because it is something that a lot of us in the industry use, but it's something that's going to speed up and improve the efficiency of your job dramatically. Very useful to have. Windows PowerShell can start and restart and stop Windows services, and certainly it does a lot more, of course. But that is one of all of the things on this list. That is the one that is the most likely reason for this automation what we would use it. Now, we have other answers here. Backing up a Linux directory, PowerShell is great for Windows, but... PowerShell is not commonly used to back up something on Linux. We would use the Linux command line and other utilities to be able to do that. It would certainly not be the most likely reason given all of the different options here. We also have 4% that said customize the contents of a web page. It's not something you would normally use PowerShell for. You could do that with uh, JavaScript. That would be a good way to do it. In fact, that is one of the scripting languages you do need to know about is JavaScript. And that's one of the many ways to customize the contents of a web page. We have convert rows in a spreadsheet. I would say using Visual Basic for applications in Windows would be a good way to do that. Not something we would generally use PowerShell for, of course. And updating certificates on a Mac OS device. Again, it's a different operating system than Windows. And it would not be very common for you to update certificates on a Mac OS device using a utility in Windows. Certainly not the most common or most likely, given the other options out here. Because restarting Windows services, that is right in the, in the wheelhouse for PowerShell. That's what PowerShell does. It gets into the details of the Windows operating system. You can modify uh, different aspects of the operating system itself. You can update registry settings. You can configure different settings in group policy. It is very, very useful 
to make all of that work. So PowerShell is really the answer here that by far would be the most likely reason for this automation. And those of you that answered restart Windows services, that would be almost 78% of you got that one absolutely right. Let's do another one. I've got another multiple choice based question for you. This next question asks, a user would like to modify the actions when a laptop cover is closed. Where should this configuration be changed? Would it be Device Manager, Power Options, Ease of Access Center, User Accounts, or System Properties? A user would like to modify the actions when a laptop cover is closed. Where should this configuration be changed? This would be in Device Manager, Power Options, Ease of Access Center, User Accounts, or System Properties. If you think you know the answer, follow the links on your screen. Go to vvox.app and use the ID there, or simply go to professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. If you think you know the answer, please answer on one of those links. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We'll step through this. We have, uh, see, it, it's sort of uh, uh, Rafi in the chat room is cheating. Uh, because he says, I literally just changed that config five minutes ago. See, I, are, I knew you'd be doing that when I wrote these questions over the weekend. I thought, well, about that time, Rafi will have just done this. Let's add a question in so that he can answer it. So you've got it. Yeah, everybody else is calling him a cheater. Uh, there may be some temporal type time dilation issue there. So we should absolutely look into that as well. So we'll have to find out what's going on there. Did he plant that into my brain earlier in a previous study group, and I thought about it, and now he's simply taking advantage? Who knows? We'll find out. Rafi says, I'm a time traveler. That, that solves the problem right there. That explains everything. Now we know what caused that to happen. Let's see how you did with this. When a user would like to modify the actions when a laptop cover is closed, where should this configuration be changed? Should it be changed in Device Manager, Power Options, Ease of Access Center, User Accounts, or System Properties? Let's stop the poll and see how you did. And I am I am surprised because I thought there would be more people choosing other options here. 87% of you chose power options. It's what you decided would be the right answer. Is this one of those times where we all decided an answer that sounded like the question but really wasn't the answer? Or is it the real answer? We'll find out in a second. We have 4%, oh, 5% say system properties, 4% say device manager, and then 1% apiece for ease of access center and user accounts. So if you wanted to go and look at the details of where you would configure settings associated with power, those options for power are under the link called power options. Maybe this was a little bit too straightforward. We'll have to have to see, I have to deconstruct this in the post game to see really what was going on. So if you're on a, a computer and you want to close the lid of your laptop and have that laptop continue to work in Windows, you would go to Power Options. You can also select different options for USB devices, how the fingerprint readers work, how different options are available during startup. They're all in here. You can really have a lot of customization over almost every aspect of the hardware on your system and how much power it happens to use. I think a lot of operating systems have started getting this one uh, very detailed. They're starting to put a lot more options in there. Uh, for instance, Linux has similar options available. Mac OS does the same thing. The power options here are the ones that you would find in Windows. And this is, uh, this is one you may keep visiting over and over again just to tweak it to get the most possible battery life out of your system. Maybe that's just me. But I do that a lot. I go in and, well, we, we could turn that down a little more. We could get a, little, a few more minutes out of our laptop if we change that setting. And this is where you spend all of that time going through and understanding what the options are for power. So that means the, that 87% of you got that one absolutely right. Now, these other options, Device Manager, for example, is a good option, but it is there to enable or disable different hardware settings or define configuration options for that hardware it doesn't define how, lap, how the system responds when you close the laptop cover. 
So that's that's not one that would work either. Uh, system properties, 6% of you chose that one. The system properties are there to provide other options for the system. You can see a lot about your system and make configuration changes to swap files and system protection. But it doesn't provide you with any details about how the system is to operate when you push a certain button or close a certain laptop. You've also got Ease of Access Center, which is certainly important if you're someone who needs uh, a different type of interaction with the operating system to help with audio or visual type challenges. You also have user accounts where you can enable, disable, or change aspects of a user's account. But none of that has anything to do with what happens when you close a Windows laptop. In this case, the answer by far, 87% of you chose power options. And you're absolutely right. That is the correct answer. Well, as you can already tell, we are covering a lot of different topics in this particular study group. And indeed, the Core 1 and Core 2 exams cover a huge amount of information. It's, it's almost insurmountable. I say almost because we obviously have a comprehensive video course that covers every topic from the exam objectives. But what if you don't have time to go through all 137 videos which really makes up about 19 hours of content. And I recognize not everybody does. So it would be nice if everything from every video was consolidated down to one or two single documents. And that's what we've created with our course notes. We have a core one course notes and a core two course notes. And those provide you with a great detail of everything that's all of the text, all of the important tables, all of the graphics, all of the information about command lines, they're all here. So this is the section that does show you every single one of those command lines and what's there. You can even see just under my head there, there's Winver. There's the one that you would find if you were looking at that video. This is the digital version of these course notes. There's obviously a physical version as well. It contains the same information, but it's written in book form. We've taken dead trees and we've planted new trees, but we've taken the dead ones and created books out of them. It's a nice way to, to work through this. As a, as a part of a family that has a tree farm, that's pretty important for us because sometimes you like to have a physical book to look through, but you don't want the guilt that comes with cutting down a tree. Don't worry, we're planting trees right behind it. And this is also a great way to have everything in one place. Uh, they're all here. If you get the physical version also, I'll mention, you get the digital version for free. You can download it immediately while you're waiting for me to ship this physical version to you. These are full color. They are comprehensive through every video that we have. They are bound with perfect bound, they call it. That's the kind you'd commonly see on a paperback book. And they are, I, I wouldn't publish anything that was anything less than what I would read. So that is the key, have high quality and be able to have study materials that actually make sense for a change. The, you find out more about those, visit my website. Go to professormesser.com slash 1102 notes is what you would put in. Or simply follow the pull-down menus at the top and choose the core to course notes for more information. Uh, this also helps what we're doing here to create even more videos. So thank you for supporting what we do here. Hopefully, it's also given you something you can use to study. I think that's a win-win, and we appreciate your support there. Let's do some more questions, shall we? I've got more multiple-choice-based questions ahead, so let's do another one. This one asks, a user is required to use a code generator when authenticating to the network. Which of the following would best describe this process? Is this single sign-on, multi-factor, encrypting file system, group policy, or software as a service? Got a few options there. A user is required to use a code generator when authenticating to the network. Which of the following would best describe this process? Is that single sign-on, multi-factor, encrypting file system, group policy, or software as a service? If you think you know the answer, use the links on your screen professormesser.com slash QA or use the vvox.app link that is on the screen as well. This is one, hopefully you've, you've gone through this. Hopefully a lot of your accounts ask for a code generator when you're authenticating. And if they don't, you should probably find out if you have the option, especially for things on the internet. Internet is, is quite a challenge sometimes in making sure that everything is secure. And this can be a very good way to help secure things. But what do we call it? What's the name of it? How do, we, how do we take advantage of this? Well, that's the question. Let's see how you do with this question. Maybe this is one that you're familiar with working through these. 
you know, whenever you get into the core two, you get a lot more security questions because there's an entire domain on the core two exam that is about security. So that's a good reason why this shows up. Some people, sometimes people will ask, why are you doing that? Why are you going through the list of these? Uh, and that's because security's on there. Uh, we already saw that earlier in our question about uh, about someone sending you a malicious link and what that could be. Let's see how you did with this one. The question again asks, a user is required to use a code generator when authenticating to the network. Which of the following would best describe this process? Is it single sign-on, multi-factor, encrypting file system, group policy, or software as a service? What did you answer? I don't know. Let's find out. And you answered... Again, in a, in, a, in a landslide, I'm going to make all of these impossible to answer next month. I've just decided. Multi-factor came in at 86% of you asked this one. You've got a huge amount of data here to step through. Single sign-on only got 8%. Encrypting file system, group policy, and software as a service came in at about 1% to 2% apiece. So this is the real key is knowing what you can use to be able to sign on. And we call this... Uh, multi-factor authentication, sometimes it's a, uh, uh, the, what we're trying to do is provide different ways to authenticate using different methods. So those methods would be something you are, something you have, something you know, somewhere you are, or something you do. That's one of many different types of multi-factor authentication that you might be, be requested to use on your system. Maybe someone's giving you a physical key like this one, a key fob, something you can carry around with you. And when you have that with you, it gives you a random or a pseudo random number, a seemingly random number that's popping up every 30 seconds or every minute. Usually it's about every 30 seconds. And, and it is able to uh, synchronize with the system or it is already synchronized with the system back uh, at your headquarters. So when you're typing in this number, it already knows what number you should be typing in. And if you type it in right, you can, of course, get all of these to work properly. This is, uh, this is also an app you might have on your phone. It's the same idea. This type of multi-factor authentication is something you have. So if you're the one that we're looking at on the screen right now with this pseudo-random token generator, what we call them, is something you have. Now, you would think, it, well, it's giving you a number. Isn't that number something you know? Well, you didn't know the number till you hit the button on the authentication tool. So that's not a number you know. <laughs> you didn't know this when you walked in the door. It's something that you have. If you did not have this with you, you would not be able to authenticate. Same thing for your mobile phone. Your mobile phone becomes a multi-factor authentication technology because there's an app on your phone and that app is the one providing that code. You have your phone with you. It's something you have. So that's the important consideration there. If you didn't have your phone, well, first, how could you breathe? And secondly, you wouldn't be able to get the code off of your phone, and you would not be able to log in. That is the right answer. Multi-factor, 86% of you would not be single sign-on. A good number of you did choose that option. I was, I was hoping you would, <laughs> hoping more if you would. Uh, I don't hope for people to get these wrong, but I expect that there will be a certain number. Uh, and you surprised me. You're much smarter than what I thought. Single sign-on means that once you put in the username and password, that's the only time you have to put it in for that day. And usually there will be a system behind the scenes that makes sure that it knows to do this. Windows networks are very commonly associated with single sign-on because they use Kerberos. And when you log in for the first time, there's a cryptographic process that gives you a cryptographic key that you could use behind the scenes to authenticate without having to type all of these things in every time. So single sign-on, although very commonly used in conjunction with multi-factor. It doesn't have to be, though. And this description of what we're doing here by inputting a code on a token generator is not describing single sign-on. It's describing multi-factor. Encrypting file system is a way to encrypt the files that you're storing on a Windows network or a Windows device. It has nothing to do with code generators or logging into the network. Group policy is a way to manage these devices, to set policies that these devices will follow. For example, you might use group policy to be able to define how long a password might be, but it's not one that describes the process of using the code generator itself. And then software as a service is a very generic way to describe a type of software you would use in a cloud-based infrastructure. 
It really has nothing to do with authentication, but it sounds pretty cool. So I put it in here, software as a service. And the real answer, of course, is the 186% of you chose, which is multi-factor. That is the right answer. That's the one we were looking for. You guys did great with this one. What a large number of folks chose that one, being able to work through this. So let's see if we know something now about malware. We're going to stick with sort of the security topics here. And I'm going to give you a question dealing specifically with this. We're going to go through which phase of the malware removal process may require WinPE. That's W-I-N-P-E. Which phase of the malware removal process may require WinPE? Is that educate the end user, quarantine, schedule scans, remediate, or verify symptoms. Got a few options there. Which phase of the malware removal process may require win PE? Is it educate the end user, quarantine, schedule scans, remediate, or verify symptoms? If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA, lock in that answer. I'll follow the links on your screen for VVox. People are making fun of me that I can't breathe when I don't have my phone with me. It's the worst feeling when you're somewhere and you realize, wait, where's the phone? Where's the phone? Where's the phone? Where is it? Where is it? I don't know. Oh, it's right here. It's in my pocket. Got it. There's that momentary panic that sets in. Uh, fortunately, and, and hopefully you're doing this too, the phone's already updated on, on your cloud-based system. It's already backed up. So if the phone died right now, if I lost my phone, it wasn't available, I could always get another phone and update it and we'd be fine. So it's not as it's not as near death as the as the chat room is mentioning. Uh, it's not quite as bad as it could be. The part that's the most painful when that happens is that's an expensive thing to have to deal with. Uh, the important part of this question, some of you are mentioning this, and I don't want to give too much away in the in this, is you have to know every aspect of the question to be able to answer it. So let's step through this question and see how you did. The question asks, which phase of the malware removal process may require WinPE? Is that educate the end user, quarantine, schedule scans, remediate, or verify symptoms? And let's see what you chose in your malware removal process. Now we have a little bit more of a controversy here. We can really work through this. Remediate came in at 48%. Not quite half, but I think close enough we can call it that. We have 19% that say the quarantine phase is where we would use WinPE. 18% say schedule scans, which means that's basically tied. And then 11% or so say it's verify symptoms. Only 2% of you say educate the end user. Well, in this case, remediate came in just under a half. It didn't quite get the majority. But remediate is a pretty good answer, especially if you are someone dealing with removing malware from a system. Of course, you know my default for removing malware is to simply delete everything on the machine and start from scratch. But there may be times when you need to access something in that operating system and you need to get it running just well enough that you're able to get into this system and be able to retrieve what you need, at which point I would hope you would just delete the whole thing and, and build it back from scratch or a known good backup because that's the best way to get rid of malware. It's the only way to guarantee that you are going to be able to get rid of that malware. Now, you could start in safe mode. That gives you options to the operating system that might get around some of the nastiness of the malware itself. In practical terms, that just doesn't work very well. We need to have some other way to gain access to the operating system without starting the operating system itself. What if we had some type of lightweight operating system, something we could run that was very similar to Windows, but it wasn't running the Windows operating system that is on the computer? We refer to that as the Windows pre-installation environment, or WinPE. That is a... Uh, a, a type of Windows that is designed to run with the bare minimum functionality. And it's small enough that you can have it on a type of boot media. So you can boot from a system that has WinPE on it, and it presents you with a little bit of a, a simplified desktop. This is really what it looks like when you're running the WinPE. Or, or that's safe mode, rather. I have another image on the the course that has WinPE on it. 
Uh, but this is one where you are able to run the recovery console. If you're doing that, you're running WinPE. If you're starting up and running the command line option from the Windows startup, that is one that is Windows PE under the surface. So all of the things that we're constantly using for troubleshooting, it's really running WinPE when you're doing that. You can create even your own customized version of WinPE by going through the process of the Windows Assessment and Deployment Kit, or the ADK, and you can build it with your own utilities. Maybe there's certain things you like to have available at the command prompt when you're troubleshooting. You can build your own Windows pre-installation environment that's customized for you. There used to be a number of really interesting Windows PEs that we would share on the internet. Uh, folks are finding that the boot up process that's in the base is now pretty pretty nice. Has a lot of the tools that you would normally use, and a lot of the customizations that were on the internet are no longer there because of that. Um, so Windows PE, the pre-installation environment, was the right answer there, and it was during the remediate phase. This is the phase where you're trying to boot the system or remove the malware from the system that you're booting from. Uh, Windows PE can get you around some of the problems there. Educating the end user is the last phase. It's one where you're talking to the end user about how they got this malware and ways that they can prevent getting this malware in the future has nothing to do with the pre-installation environment. Quarantining a system doesn't really require anything technical. You simply walk over and unplug the network connection and make sure that everything else is disabled on the network on the wireless side and you've quarantined the system. You don't need to reboot the system or use the pre-installation environment just to be able to quarantine a system. Same thing for scheduling scans. There's usually a scanning process built into the antivirus or anti-malware or EDR, whatever you're using on that system. That scanning process is one built into that software, and WinPE is not used to configure the scanning for that. Verifying the symptoms is something you do not something that WinPE does. You're looking at a system and you're seeing pop-up boxes suddenly move. You're watching the mouse move across the screen without anyone touching the mouse. You're noticing that things are happening inside of a browser that normally would not be happening. Those can certainly be symptoms associated with malware and something that you're making the determination, not WinPE. The correct answer here, the one you should have chosen, the one that 48% of you chose, is remediate. That is the phase of the removal process that does require Win PE. Now, if you're watching this video for continuing education unit credit, and you're watching this not only live, but especially if you're watching on the replay, uh, one way that you can earn a, or the way that you can earn a continuing education unit credit for watching this is to follow these instructions. You go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, you click on the Contact Us link. On the form that pops open, put your name, your email address. In the subject line, put November 2023 Core 2. And in the body of the message on the line by itself, put the super secret code word of the month, WinPE. WinPE is the super secret code word of the month. That is the one that I would like you to put into that. And you can simply send the form to me at that point. You don't have to put anything else in there. But if you would like to add additional details about what you're studying, uh, how far you've gotten in your studies, the process or reason why you're getting this. I'd love to read about them or anything else that you'd like to put as a message to me. I'm the one that reads through all of these. I'm the one that processes all of them. So I like I do enjoy reading through all of them. Unfortunately, I get hundreds of these in a month and I'm, I'm not able to personally respond to every single one of them. But that is something that is uh, is nice to go through as, we're, as I'm cycling through and sending these out. It's nice to see your messages in there, and I do appreciate it. So again, you go to the super the uh, Professor Messer website uh, at, and follow the Contact Us link at the top. Uh, in the Contact Us form that comes up, put your name, your email address in the subject line. Put, the, put November 2023 Core 2. That way I know where this came from. And then the body of the message on the line by itself, put the super secret code word of the month, WinPE. 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 WinPE is the super secret code word of the month. And it takes me about a week or so to turn these around. I think I might get them out this weekend. So if you get them in today, you'll get an email from me this weekend that has been digitally signed so you know that nobody changed anything in that message between the time that I sent it and the time that you received it. That might help you just a little bit with working through these. Let's do another question. I really think this one is kind of a gimme, and I almost didn't put this one in here, but we've got more questions. Don't worry. 
But I, it is an important thing to know, and it's certainly from the CompTIA exam objective, so I left it in anyway because let's find out if we know it or not. The question asks, a user in the European Union has requested the removal of their personal information from a website. Which of the following would apply to this request? Would that be PCI DSS, PHI, GDPR, TPM, or EULA? Not even going to say it right. A user in the European Union has requested the removal of their personal information from a website. Which of the following would apply to this request? Is that PCI DSS, PHI, GDPR, TPM, and EULA? See, I said it right that time. I thought it wasn't necessary to really spell out everything, was it? Let me move my head out of the way so you can see the question and be able to answer it by visiting professormesser.com slash QA and answer the question there. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We're going to answer the question by following the links that are on your screen, either on the vvox.app link or the professormesser.com slash QA link. They both go the same place, ultimately. You can't go wrong in being able to make that happen. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We'll see how this goes. Uh, this is one where if you're you're working along the way of making some of these things happen, um, and you may find yourself, uh, even if you don't live in the European Union, you may live somewhere else, you may still have to deal with this. And that's why it's in the CompTIA exam objectives. Make sure you're familiar with all of these terms, by the way, are in the Core 2 exam objectives. Make sure you know what each one of these things are. If you're looking at any of these abbreviations and wondering, I don't know what that abbreviation is, and I don't understand how I would use that in any form. <laughs> so that should be something you can circle or write down or make a note of so that you can go back to your exam objectives and understand where would I use any one of these different abbreviations. Again, it's important on the exam that you not just know what the letters in the abbreviation stand for, it's perhaps more important that you understand how you would implement or use that particular technology that is associated with that acronym. And that's one of the things on the test. You'll never get a question on the test that is asking you what the letters are in an abbreviation. So hopefully, that should be something you're familiar with. Uh, all of these are in the exam objectives, not the acronym list. All of these are in the exam objectives. I don't really care so much for the acronym list that's in the back of the objectives. I care about what's in the actual objectives, because that's what's going to be on your exam. Make sure you're familiar with those. Let's see how you did with this one. The question asks, a user in the European Union has requested the removal of their personal information from a website. Which of the following would apply to this request? Is it PCI DSS, PHI? GDPR, TPM, or EULA? Let's see how you did with this question. As we lock it in, we can see that 63% of us say GDPR, 22% of us say EULA. That's a pretty good number for GDPR, but also a very good number for EULA. We have almost 10% said PHI, 5% or so said PCI DSS, and then only 1% said TPM. Well, the real key in this question was that we were trying to remove personal information from a website, and we were in the EU. I guess we should expand that out, but it's not just the EU. It could also be the UK as well. It all applies to this particular regulation, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. This is one where the governments of the EU and the UK uh, got together and said, how can we make privacy stronger in our particular area of the world? And what they did was institute a number of rules and regulations that allowed you as the user to dictate to a website owner how your information can be used. So you've got a few different options there to be able to work through those. It's, it is a challenge dealing with this on a worldwide basis because every country has their own way of doing things. Although this is the GDPR and it's specific to the EU, in some cases, companies outside of the EU would technically be required to follow these particular guidelines, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, it's one of those challenges with international laws. You never know how far the international law goes until somebody takes the international law to court 
and I would not like to be the person that we get to try this on. So that's that's the problem. If you're the first one, you're the one who has to go through the legal process. So we we tend to do that. Now, if you sent me a note and said, I want you to delete everything from the my website, even though I'm in the U.S., my website's in the U.S., technically this law is associated with people who do business outside the U.S., but technically there's no way for people outside the U.S. to tell me what to do. So there's the problem with international law, of course. Um, but I like to, if somebody asks and I'm able to delete it, I absolutely do. Why wouldn't I? So I don't need a law for that. I just ask me and I'll do that. Now, if you purchase something that's different, we have laws in the U.S. that require me to keep particular kinds of documents, particular kinds of purchase uh, information, especially for a certain time frame by our, uh, our IRS. So I can't delete everything associated with a transaction. But if it's something that you haven't bought anything, you just have an account, you'd like to delete it, yeah, we can do that. And that's the point of the GDPR is to provide that level of privacy and give the user control of what happens to their data. That didn't always turn out exactly that smoothly to be able to make that happen. Uh, but I think that's that is a, a good way to kind of focus on this and, and be able to focus through this US law US does not have a law that provides that level of control from the user. There are certain states that have started a similar thing. If you live in California, for example, California has a, a type of law that's very similar to GDPR, at least in style and structure. Uh, but it is not the same thing. Um, and I have no laws where I live that require me to do anything along those lines other than the, the ones that are certainly global for the United States. That's one of the challenges when you have 50 little states in this United States, and each one of them has their own different way of doing things. Uh, sometimes we need, and, and laws almost, almost always uh, are a challenge to synchronize and consolidate, certainly up at the federal level. Let's let's not get into that conversation. 22% of you chose EULA, though. EULA stands for End User License Agreement. If you install software, you know that big, long text that you just scroll through and you hit accept at the bottom without reading a word of it? That's a EULA. <laughs> and you probably should read it because it has important information in there about how you're able to use this software, how you're able to back up this software, what is legal, what is not legal, and that can certainly be an important consideration. If you are a corporation... You don't have the luxury of scrolling down and hitting accept. In fact, every time I have worked with a corporation to sell them a product, especially a product with software, there has been a very long, a relatively long process of back and forth between the company making the software and the legal team of the customer to determine what the terms of that EULA are before the software is purchased. It's a very big deal uh, because you don't want a company providing you with a EULA that restricts your ability to do business. It is a, it's a legal binding bit of text. So it's important the lawyers get together and make sure both sides are happy before that software is purchased and implemented and the EULA is approved to. Uh, they don't have the luxury of scrolling to the bottom and clicking OK. We also have PCI DSS, which is another, not really a regulation, but a set of policies that you must follow from the payment card industry and dictates how you're able to or the proper best practices for storing and maintaining the security of people's credit card information. Uh, we also have PHI, personal health information. Health information was not what we were talking about here. We were talking about the EU request, we're requesting removal of personal information. It did not specifically mention health, although this answer could technically be associated with this question. It would not be the best fit, though. The best fit is indeed GDPR. We know that from EU, and we know that from personal information. And the TPM, Trusted Platform Manager, is a bit of hardware and software that's usually embedded into the motherboard of a device that you're using to provide a number of cryptographic services. It has nothing to do with requesting removal of personal information. The only answer here, the one we chose, the one that makes sense, is indeed the GDPR. That's the one that I think you would have chosen. Uh, most of you did choose. 63% of you got that one absolutely right. Uh, I know we're at the top of the hour, but let's do another question. I think we can fit another one in here, right? Let's do this one because I, I wanted to get another one of these in. This question, here we go. This question asks, uh, a, network a network administrator has identified eight hops between the local network and a SaaS provider. How did the admin make this determination? Was that determined through NetStat, TraceRT, IPConfig, Ping, 
or NetView. A network administrator has identified eight hops between the local network and a SaaS provider. How did the admin make this determination? Did they use NetStat, TraceRT, IPConfig, Ping, or NetView? If you think you know the answer, please no answers in the chat room. You want to go to the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, and lock in your answer. That's the one you should do. Yes, GDPR, as I mentioned earlier in the chat room, is asking, does that only apply to the EU? In, I guess, functionally, yes, that's the only thing that is, is just the EU because that's where the penalties come from. Now, there is an international aspect of this where the EU has said, no, we can make you do it, you in the U.S. Uh, nobody's really pushed that yet to determine, can they really? I mean, you can send me a bill. I'm probably not going to pay it. So that's that's the problem, what most people in the UI, uh, outside the EU are saying, is that, well, it's a lovely idea, and we'll we'll certainly try to uh, stick to the, the idea of protecting people's information. Uh, but that is indeed one of those where um, it may not have any teeth once it gets out of the EU. Nobody's really tested it yet. Fortunately, most companies have been very good about protecting your data. Most have. But there are a few that have not, and that's really what these rules are for. So I'm looking forward to that legal battle, should it occur. I always get fascinated over those types of things. So we'll see what happens with that one. I don't want to be a part of it, though. Not interested. If you don't want to, your data on my systems, just tell me I'll get rid of it. Unless you bought something, and then the IRS will tell me if I can get rid of it. And the IRS, much more important to me than anybody in the EU right now. That's, that's the challenge. Uh, so let's see how you did with this one. A network administrator has identified eight hops between the local network and a SaaS provider. How did the admin make this determination? Is it NetStat, TraceRT, IPConfig, Ping, or NetView? What did you answer? Well, let's find out. And we've got, it was, a, it was an easy one. Traceroute, 80% of you chose TraceRT or Traceroute as the option that is the one you should have chosen for something like this. That's what would really make that determination on what's between you and another location. How many routers do you traverse to get between one device and another? And what are the IP addresses of those routers? And what are the, the response times that it takes to get a response back from these routers that are on these networks? So that is pretty useful to be able to, to know. If you're someone who's really working through and understanding what, how do I even make that determination? How, many, how do I know how many routers I happen to traverse and be able to make through it? It's how you would use Traceroute to make that happen. Traceroute commonly uses ICMP time exceeded messages to be able to provide this information. And if any of these routes along the way happen to filter out ICMP, then Traceroute may not be incredibly valuable. So hopefully, this gives you a couple of options as to what you could choose for finding out how you get there. Now, trace route's not only good to see from a sort of a response time perspective, but if you know what the route should be and you run a trace route and the route happens to be different, you know something is going a little odd with the routing methods on that network. So that's what you would run into. Trace route, clearly the answer here. 80% of you got that one right. 8% 8, 8 said NetStat. And a NetStat, of course, stands for network statistics. It sounds like it should be the right answer. But NetStat is really designed to give you information about what's happening on your machine, what types of sessions may be inbound, what type of traffic may be outbound, what applications are causing that traffic to either be inbound or outbound traffic. NetStat can provide you with routing tables and other details, but it doesn't tell you how many actual hops there are between point A and point B. So NetStat would not be the right answer. Ping, 8% of you said ping. Ping is great for determining if the end station on the other end of this connection is responding or not responding, but it doesn't tell you how many routers did I have to hop through to send or receive that ping. It doesn't tell you. It can You can guess and get a little bit of insight looking at time to live, but it's not the most accurate thing either. I want to be able to know that there are eight hops and be able to identify what those eight hops are. And net, uh, Traceroute is the best answer for doing something like that. IPConfig can show you IP information, the configuration information of a local device. has nothing to do with how many hops there might be 
on a network link. And NetView, commonly used to see if there are any Windows shares available on a particular server or service, NetView has nothing to do with identifying hops on the network either. The correct answer here is traceroute. Here's an example of the traceroute output that shows you where you're traceroting to. I traceroted from my machine to 9.9.9.9. And you can see there are eight hops between my machine or my router at 10.1.10.1. You're welcome to try to hack that one if you can get to it. We've also got quad nine at 9.9.9.9. That's the name quad nine. Uh, and those are the hops. Those are the different routes to get between point A and point B. They're all listed there. Uh, that is how we know what the different options are for this. And traceroute is the best answer for doing something along those lines. And if you answer traceroute in that link, you got that one absolutely correct. Well done. Well, somebody in the chat room asked for another question. Uh, and one of the things I like to make people aware of is that if you want more questions that are really designed to be questions from uh, or have a similar tone to what you would find on the actual exam, you should have a look at my practice exams book. My practice exams is a 380-page book. There are 90 questions in each of the three practice exams that are there. So you get quite a few questions that are listed. And this consists of both multiple-choice-based questions, performance-based questions, and they are written to have the same feel as the actual exam questions. One of the challenges I've seen with practice exams online is that they are asking questions that don't come from the latest exam version. They're not telling you a lot about why a question is right or why a question is wrong. And sometimes they're completely inaccurate. They're not correct at all. You never know what you may be getting out on the internet. And so I wrote a book where I know the questions and answers are correct. I know that those questions are related to the current version of the exam. And I would argue that this is one of the most accurate set of practice questions you will get. Now, some of you have sent me notes saying, I took my exam. None of the questions on my exam were in your book. Yeah, it's not that kind of book. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what we do here. Uh, we're learning. We're trying to figure out the details so that you can answer any question that happens to come up. It's in the practice exams. So let's go through a question from my practice exams. This is my practice exams book. I have the PDF here on my screen right now. And let's do it. question A35. And again, please, no answers in the chat room. Just guess in your mind. We don't have a, a front end to be able to answer this one. You're just going to follow along with me. The question asks, a network administrator has configured all of their wireless access points with WPA3 security. Which of the following technologies would be associated with this configuration? Would it be RC4, TACAX, TKIP, or GCMP? Now, this is a PDF, so it's very easy. If I'd like to annotate the PDF, I can mark different things on the screen. If I have a stylus, I can write on the screen if I want to. If I think I know the answer, I can even select it on the screen. So you've got options of how you can use this PDF. It's an open PDF so that you can go in and make these changes. I don't limit you from being able to annotate. I hate PDFs that are locked down where you can't use it as a PDF. Well, my practice exams book, you absolutely can. Another thing that I've done in my book is this is on page 13 of my practice exams book. The quick answers, if you just want to know if it's A, B, C, or D, you can flip over to page 33. And if you want to know detailed answers, it's on page 71. Now, if you're in a physical book, like the physical practice exams book I have here, it's very easy to flip over to page 71 and see what the answer is. But on a PDF, if you've ever had to deal with PDFs, you'd have to scroll, 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 scroll. And then once you want to go back, you have to scroll back, 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 back just to see that. But instead, because it's a PDF, I put the links directly in the PDF itself. So I can click the words, the details, and it will take me immediately to page 71, where I indeed I have the question again. I have the possible answers, and it tells me that the actual answer is GCMP, and it explains why GCMP is the correct answer associated with WPA3. Now, one of the things that is important to me, and if you've ever taken a practice exam online, you've probably seen this, is that that is the right answer, and it told me why it's the right answer. Now, if I got it right, that's great, but I already knew it. I got it right. What if you didn't get it right? What if you answered TKIP? Or what if you had answered TACAX? So what I've done in my book is every answer has documented, whether it's right or wrong, why that answer is right or why that answer is wrong. 
Because I think if you're in the process of learning and preparing for your exam, it's probably even more valuable to get a list of why the incorrect answer was incorrect so you understand why it was incorrect and you know how to apply that knowledge next time. In fact, I'll even tell you if you got it right, you need to go through and read the incorrect answers too just so you know what those are referring to. That way, if you get a question on your exam about TKIP or TACAX or RC4, you know what those technologies are about because I gave you a breakdown of all of those. You'll notice this is something I do in this book. Every time there's an abbreviation, the first time for that question, I put the entire word of what that abbreviation is. I try to get that on every single abbreviation. So if you didn't know what RC4 is, there it is. If you didn't know what TACAC stands for, there it is. If you didn't know what TKIP stands for, there it is. You Now you know what you see it. That helps you verify in your mind, oh, that's what that's referring to. It's the Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. That's what TKIP is. Of course it is. So you don't have to keep referring back or simply reading through this and not understanding what those abbreviations are in the first place, which drives me crazy. And since it's a PDF, there's a back button. Do you know there's a back button in your PDF? There is. And I'm going to use my back button right here at the top, and I'm back to where I started. And I can simply go to the next question on the list. So it's an easy way to access this information and be able to read it on any platform in any operating system. It doesn't matter if you have iOS. It doesn't matter if you have Android. It doesn't matter if you're running Linux. It doesn't matter if you're on Windows or Mac OS. This works on all of them. It's my practice exams book. You can find out more at professormesser.com slash core2pe. A great way to learn a little bit more and prepare yourself before you walk into that exam. So have a look at that. See if that's something that might help you. And I can either provide you with the immediate digital download for these physical, uh, the editions work the same way that if you buy the physical book that I will ship to you, you also get the digital version for free. So you can download it immediately and start using it. Well, I think at that point, we have definitely hit the top of the hour. But I'll remind you that all of the questions we went through today and all of these topics came directly from the, Comp the CompTIA Core 2 exam objectives. These objectives are free. Uh, you can download them, and everything is there and available to you. If you've never seen these objectives, they are, they are just chock full of information. They are full of details. I tell people often that if you know every bullet that is in these exam objectives, you're going to pass your exam. And that's the question that people tend to ask is, how do I know when I'm ready? How do I know if I've learned the right thing? Well, have you gone through the exam objectives and used it as a checklist? Because this is the best checklist you will find for the exam, and it's all spelled out for you. By the way, you don't get this with other exams. Cisco doesn't do this for you. Microsoft certainly doesn't do this for you. Uh, uh, Amazon doesn't do this for you. A lot of those other exams that are out there don't do this. So a lot of details here. CompTIA stays very close to these objectives, almost exclusive to these objectives, regardless of what other people on the internet will tell you, which is they'll tell you, oh, they could ask you anything. Well, they could, but they don't. They stick to these objectives like it is just only thing you would do, like exclusively. Maybe you might get a question that is off of these object objectives, but uh, most of the time those questions are ones that they put in there intentionally just to see what you would answer, and they don't grade it, something they, they probably don't tell you and make aware of you. So hopefully that is something that you're familiar with, is these objectives. They are very valuable. Make sure you get your hands on those. They are available on the CompTIA website. Simply search for CompTIA exam objectives or go to professormesser.com slash objectives, and there's a link that will take you right over. We do one of these study groups every month. Our next two A-plus study groups will be on December the 5th and December the 7th. Uh, we have more in November. Our Network Plus study group this month is on the 21st. Our Security Plus study group is on the 28th. And in December, we kind of move things around a little bit, the 5th and 7th, as I just said, for A-plus. Network Plus is on the 13th of December and on the 20th of December is Security Plus. Now, you don't have to remember that. I've got everything on the calendar. If you're ever wondering when the next live event is going to be, simply go to professormesser.com slash calendar or use the events link at the top of the page and you'll be able to find when the next live event is going to be. I also have this in the Discord. There's a channel just for events and I always keep it updated with the latest calendar there. So you can't, can't go wrong there on both of those. December 5th and December 7th are our next 
A plus study groups. Well, the first hour is done, but we're not done yet. Stick around for the second hour where I'm going to take questions from you in the chat room. We have a lot of information to go through there, and I can't wait to see what questions you might have for me. The Q&A that's there can be also submitted in VBox or from ProfessorMesser.com slash QA, and those questions are open right now if you wanted to submit anything into those. Don't forget about our course notes and practice exams on our website at ProfessorMesser.com slash 1102 success. We also have our vouchers and exam hacks ebook. Uh, is available at professormesser.com slash vouchers. And don't forget, we're on social media. We're on Discord. We're on Twitter, whatever it's called now. We're on YouTube. We're on uh, LinkedIn. You simply put in professormesser.com slash the name of the place you'd like to find me. So professormesser.com slash Discord. We'll take you to our Discord, for example. A good way to find us. Well, that brings us to the end of the first hour of our study group. Stick around for the after show where I will take your questions. Thank you so much for being here. We will see you next time on the A-plus study group. Okay. I'll take a sip. I will bring back my face. Where am I? There I am. We hit the right buttons and everything works. So now is the after show part of the study group. Clearly, you guys were on it today. Your numbers were exceptional with these questions you put in. You did much better than I thought you would do, which means I need to, I need to up my game a bit, make this a wee bit harder, just a little bit, just a smidge more difficult in, in December. Do not worry. There will definitely be harder questions <laughs> right there and being able to work through it. We'll see if it's something you can do for these. Uh, I, th I think you'll do fine next month, but I am going to make it a little bit more challenging, I think. You guys are you're just getting too good at this. So let's also step through some of the uh, questions you have submitted to me. You can submit any of these questions through VVox. There is a VVox front end for this that even tells you on the screen you can submit questions for the second hour of the study group at any time. We'll be monitoring questions throughout the session so your contribution may not appear immediately. And that's that's sort of normal when you work through these. You'll be able to uh, submit them, but they won't pop up on the screen. You won't see them there, but I see them. Don't worry. I am able to see them on my side, and I get to moderate and go through them, and we'll just step through them one by one. So we will start with one that is kind of a, a question about, uh, well, there we go, about renewing your certification. So renewing is an important consideration because you earn your certification and then you've got three years that certification is good. But what happens after three years? Now, if you don't renew after three years, your certification is no longer valid and you can't renew it anymore. The only way to get your A plus back after that three years is over is to take both of those exams again. Not the best situation. But there are a lot of different options for renewing. Some people will take a higher level CompTIA exam. And if you do that, you don't have to pay anything extra. You just take and pass a higher level exam and it renews your other old, your other lower level exams for another three years. Very common. We also have a lot of people that will go through the process of um, taking a third-party certification exam. Maybe you take a Cisco exam or a Microsoft exam or a Palo Alto Networks exam. Those can also apply towards the renewal. Sometimes it is a complete renewal that it will apply to. Sometimes it is a portion of the CEUs, uh, but those are an option. CompTIA also makes a renewal program called CertMaster CE. That stands for Continuing Education. Uh, CertMaster CE is a, uh, a self-guided tutorial computer-based training. And it takes you through the newer information in the latest exam and asks you a number of questions. You have to get every question right. If you don't want to get every question right, you have to read through it again. You can take, you can take the questions as many times as you want, but you have to get all of them right in a section, and there are many sections you have to go through. But once you do that... It's, uh, it's an easy way to renew your certification because it only takes three to six hours, according to CompTIA. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to renew. I created a video. It's on my website. Uh, it's also in the YouTube video description of this video. 
So you can scroll down a little bit in YouTube, and it's a video on how to renew your CompTIA certification, your A-plus, Network Plus, or Security Plus in just a few hours. Um, and we, we do step through every single one of those different options and give you advantages and disadvantages of why or why you shouldn't use a particular renewal method. Um, there's Everybody has a different way to renew. Everybody has a different set of requirements. And the way that I renew my cert may be different than the way you renew your certification. CompTIA, CompTIA has a big section on their website about renewing certifications. And I would recommend you have a look at that to understand more about what the different options might be for you. It's it's quite a read. It's quite a quite a quite a view there uh, to be able to do that. So make sure you step through all of those and understand what the different options are. Um, other questions. Let's keep going through this uh, and being able to break this down. Um, this is one. Well, if you were here, you probably know the difference already. But for those of you that have never stopped into one of our study groups before, you may be wondering, wait, there's there's other training? This is not the training or this is the training? Or, or how does this work? Because uh, there's a lot of stuff on the YouTube channel. And this is a little bit different than what you might normally find in a training class. There are effectively two, these are two different things. My video courses and my study groups are two different things. What you're watching right now is one of my study groups. They are groups that I do every month where I ask questions, you ask questions. It's just a way to us for to go through some of the objectives and learn a little bit more about the technologies. Um, something I do live, we have the Q&A, there's a little interactivity, uh, we get to talk about it. And of course, it's available for replay. If you don't catch it live, you can always watch it. Uh, it's all stored on YouTube. And there's indexes on my website where you can find everything. But it's not designed to be a comprehensive overview of every single exam objective. It's really to go through a number of topics every month and have a little bit of fun while we're studying. There is, of course, a comprehensive video course that I've created for Core 1 and Core 2 of A+, and Network Plus and Security Plus. And that entire comprehensive video course is not done live. It is all done offline and posted to YouTube. And there is an, a YouTube playlist available. And there is also a, a video index on my website for the course itself. You'll find links on my website for the video course. And you'll find other links for the study group replays. Those are the two major video-based training methods that we have, that we do, that we provide. So hopefully that will give you a little perspective of the differences between the two. And if you watch my video course, you know they're, the video course is very different. The video course is me being very specific about what I'm telling you. It's very tight. Uh, it's, it's Each video is set up to be somewhere around four to seven minutes long, sometimes a little shorter, sometimes a little longer. Uh, but it's designed to give you exactly what you need, specific to the exam objectives, based on what CompTIA is going to ask you on the exam, and then you're done. Uh, there's no Q&A. There's not interactivity. It's not me talking about different things. We're in and we're out. There's no, there's really no introduction. There's no closing. It's just here we're, we jump right into it. We talk about what you need, and we get out. Uh, it, is, it is as efficient and effective as I could make it. Um, so there are differences between the live videos and the, or the, the video-based training and the study groups. But as far as live videos where I'm talking, the only time I've effectively done anything live is in a study group format. I don't tend to just start up the camera and have conversations or start up the camera and play a game on Twitch or whatever you see a lot of the streamers doing. I don't do that kind of thing. So I really try to focus on how can I get the highest quality, most amount of training in, in the type of thing that we're doing. So that's, that's where I focus my efforts. And that's the difference between the live videos and the study groups. Um, along those lines, Chris, Chris brings up a very good point. Um, do, do you sleep? What is going on there? I feel pretty well rested actually today. Doing very good today. I, I sleep. I sleep great. Um, yeah, there, there. I, I do sleep. I just when I'm awake, it's constant content creation. When I was talking with some folks yesterday that were over, and I, we were talking about YouTube and talking about the process and talking about what we do, we spend an exceptional amount of time building content. Um, and it takes the moment I wake up in the morning, I'm up at usually about six 
and then I'm just creating content all day. I'm taking care of people's emails at the beginning and then really just creating content from that point on um, and just try to stay in every day. And I get a couple hours to myself at night where I can do other things, but uh, usually on the Xbox or something that is not technology related. I wouldn't say the Xbox is technology related. That's, inter that's entertainment. So I try to entertain myself for a couple of hours and then you sleep and the next day you do the same thing. Uh, but that is the challenge, of course. If, if you've ever talked to anyone who has a YouTube-based business or they're creating content as part of what they do for a living, you know there is a lot of content to create. It just takes a lot of time. So it may seem like I don't sleep because of how much information we are pumping out. But uh, we, we do sleep. We do sleep a little bit. We get a little more in there. Sleep is important. You should not, uh, you should not miss that. So I, I appreciate the thought of the question, though, which I am implying uh, to be, you must uh, not sleep because of all of this content that's being created. Well, it's all about how, when you get the content done. Uh, it's all about a strategy and, and that type of thing. Um, and th there are times in my career where sleep was a challenge. Uh, this is not one of those. I think I built the business around how can I sleep? Now, how would we get a business around that? It's an odd model, granted, but it's one I like a lot. Um, and going through this, let's uh, let's get another question. This one's more of a topic of of career, uh, which of course we answer in our after show. Um, this is from Ernesto. Who asks I'm currently 41 years old, work in HVAC. That's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Which you should know as part of your A plus certification. Is it? too late for me to start in IT. I have some experience. I've been watching your videos for some time now. Um, it's never too late. Uh, the challenge you always get, especially as you get into an industry and uh, a different vertical market than IT, than technology, it's always a challenge to move regardless of your age. It's always a challenge to move from some place where you've established yourself and then change careers, whether that's into IT, maybe you want to drive a truck, maybe you want to be a nurse, maybe you want to be a lawyer, maybe you want to be a doctor. It doesn't matter. People go through these things in, in midlife. You think, hmm, maybe I should do something different. Um, IT is one of those where it really doesn't matter what age you are because the computers and the routers and the firewalls, they don't know how old you are. They have no clue. They, that's, I love these machines. <laughs> they have no idea how old I am. Uh, but in that perspective, though, other people do know how old you are. The hiring manager can look at you, the people you work with, et cetera, et cetera. 41, you're young. You're good. You can, you can make the change. The challenge I tend to find when people are moving from one type of career to a very different type of career, you're changing your life, you're changing your career effectively, is that... You've built up a certain level of a seniority in your current job. So maybe in HVAC, you've worked up to a senior level. Maybe you're very familiar with the technologies that you're working with. Uh, you know exactly what you need to do. Maybe you do commercial. Maybe you do home-based. Maybe you, you've got a, a very easy knowledge. You've got the knowledge already built into what you're doing. You probably went to school to learn all of these things. There's an investment that you've made and a certain amount of money that you're probably making because of it. When you move from one industry to another, you tend to have to start at the bottom again and work your way back up. And when you start at the bottom, that generally means you're probably going to make less money, or it certainly can mean that. So I tell people all the time, this needs to be very strategic. You're not just out of college. You're not able to start at the bottom. Um, but maybe you've got different options. Maybe there's people you can live with for a certain amount of time. Maybe you can have a roommate. Maybe you can change how much, maybe you can sell a car. Maybe there's different things you can do in your lifestyle to at least get you moving because you can move up in IT relatively quickly if you are driven. And it helps if you have, a, as I mentioned, a strategy. So here, if you are someone who's starting in this and you're, you're in that midlife and you're trying to figure out how do I change this around, now we need to be smarter than someone who's just out of college. And you have collected a nice list of contacts. You know people in different companies. You know people within your own company. You have friends and neighbors that you've met throughout the years, people that you've met at church, people that you've met in the bowling league, people that you know from schools, people that you know from your kid's school. There's a lot of people you know. And you can start asking them about, do you know anyone who's hiring in IT? Do you have any friends? 
who might want to be interested in hiring somebody who's willing to work their way up through the ranks. This is where we start taking advantage of our knowledge of being an older person and the contacts that we have made, and we want to be able to use those contacts. And I will tell you, people like to hire people they know. People like to hire people they can trust. And when you are working and trying to hire someone and somebody else in your company says, oh, I know a guy who's who's moving over from HVAC. He'd love a job like this. He is he's there every day. He's there. He's the person who's there on time. Uh, you can he's, he's a smart guy. He's already got these certifications. You should talk to him. They go, oh, you know him. Yeah, bring him in. Let's talk to him. Let's get him. Let's get him on the phone. Let's do a Zoom. Let's uh, let's have him do an in-person interview. You know, they can trust you more because of someone they already know. By the way, this is not simply for someone moving between uh, one type of job and another. This is for anyone. If you have a connection and you know people, you should, I don't want to use the term take advantage of that connection because you're not taking advantage of anyone. You're simply asking someone who knows you to put in a good word for you, which if you've been living right, that's something that should be someone should be relatively pleased to do for you. Um, nobody wants to worry. And they say, oh, yeah, I'll put in a name for you. Oh, we're not going to hire him. I'm not going to put my name in. But if you've actually got good connections, you have a nice relationship with people, absolutely. Con contact those folks. You have a, should have a pretty good LinkedIn at this point, too. If you do not have a good LinkedIn, now's the time to make one. Put all your friends on the LinkedIn. Put all your family on the LinkedIn. And start adding some of the labs that you're working on, the certifications that you get, um, the things, the technologies that you found that you find interesting. Post them on LinkedIn. That's where recruiters like to look. That's where hiring managers like to look. And when you put your resume in, make sure your LinkedIn information is right there at the top so they know where to visit to get an idea of what you like, of what you do, of your technology side, of your professional side. That's what LinkedIn is for. So uh, a lot of people dismiss LinkedIn. They're missing an opportunity because LinkedIn is one of those technologies that uh, can really help you in the job hunt if you use it properly. So hopefully that will give you give you some way to approach that problem. Hopefully that's that's giving you an idea of things you should consider if you're planning to move from one type of position to another in IT. And then once you get an IT, by the way, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Because in IT, you can move to a different area of technology relatively easy just by learning about that technology. So you might start on the help desk. You might move into desktop administration. And like me, you may see somebody working on the network and think, oh, what's that over there? That's, that's shiny. That's, that's interesting. Tell me more about this network thing uh, that you're working on. And then you learn more about the network. Then you start doing network administration. And then once you start looking at network administration, you start understanding what it takes to secure the network, to secure the systems, and you might want to move up into security. So you have the ability to move around in IT and do very different jobs, even though it's all within that umbrella of information technology. So hopefully that will give you an idea where you can focus on too. Okay, so let's see uh, other options that are here. Um, there were some questions that came in and said, you said one thing, this book said another thing, who's right? I'm right. So hopefully those of didn't put the question up, but I'm correct on that one. Uh, and I explain why I'm correct in the video. So for those of you that asked that question, that is what that was about. Uh, how could you say I was not correct? How dare you? It doesn't hurt my feelings at all, I assure you. We can all in, talk about it in detail. For those of you that have asked that question, you know who you are, and you want more detail about why would I say that, this would not be the forum for it, but I'd be glad to give you more details on it. Um, so let's talk about, we talked earlier about the video course versus the live streams, um, and Chad says, well, so do you, in your video course that is on YouTube, where there are you know, 100 and something videos for core one and core two, um, and there are you know, 30 plus hours or whatever it is that's out there for A plus and being able to work through them. The question is, do you go through each objective on your core two YouTube video course? And the answer is that is exactly where we go through every objective. In fact, I go through the exam objectives. I put these up earlier, the exam objectives. When I'm making the videos, I simply go through each one of these bullets. 
So I'll start with, in section 1.6, given a scenario configure Microsoft Windows networking features on a client desktop, you'll notice I talk about work group versus domain, what shared resources are, what printers are and how you get to those, how file servers are different, how map drives work, local OS firewall settings, application restrictions and exceptions. Configure. All of this is in my video because I used the exam objectives bullet by bullet to make the video. I'll even take it a step further further for you. Uh, and let's look at what I use to build the videos. Um, uh, let's find this one. I'm typing in the wrong things as I'm typing and talking at the same time. And it doesn't ever work out so well for me. But I have a spreadsheet where I take all of the exam objectives and I break down everything. So let me give you an example of what I do when I get this. So this is for the 1102 exam. Uh, this is my A plus index, uh, video index and objectives for the 220-1102 exam. This was based on version 3, which, which was released in 2021, December 9th. Um, this is also compared to the objectives that were released for the 220-1002, which was the previous version. So all of these are marked green because I've already done them. But you can see I break down and determine for each of the exam objectives what video is that in. So for example, the video I have on an overview of Windows covers Windows 10 editions so for Home Pro, Pro for Workstations, and Enterprise. Windows features cover the things that are listed here. And then I also compare that to what was in the 1002. So in the 1002, for example, some of these topics were covered. Everything green was already covered. But the yellow ones are new. So I had to create new content on the availability of remote desktop protocol, or RDP, and the random access memory RAM support limitations. So as I scroll through this, you can see it's big. Like all of the exam objectives are over here. The video that, that uh, it compiles all of those objectives are here. And then am I having to make new content? Yeah, quite a bit. Some a lot of it's old content, but you'll see huge chunks of it are brand new. As we get further down into this, it gets more and more yellow uh, and breaking those down. That is how I make that determination and viewing all of those. So it's one of those where uh, you do have to be very dedicated and deal with each one of these very specifically. You don't want to miss anything on the objectives. And as you've probably seen, all of my videos follow those objectives from 1.1 all the way through to the end. And I think that's an easy way for people to find things. If you can't find the right information, you're reading a book, most books don't follow that format. But in the books, they often create a cross-reference between the chapter you're reading and what objectives that that chapter is covering. So that gives you a way now to cross-reference back to my videos if you wanted to add a little more context. So a little bit more details on that, being able to work through them. Um, here's another one. Well, uh, this is more of a timing thing. And this is a question that came up before. In fact, I'm going to put two questions up for this one. Um, and we'll go through each one of those. Uh, we'll start with Amy, who said, I passed my 1101, but failed my 1102 twice. Urgh. Don't worry, you're going to get it the third time. How long do I have to get certified? Well, one of the things about the A plus is you can just keep taking these exams until you pass it. So technically, you haven't failed yet because you're still planning to take the exam again. Uh, you only fail if you stop taking the exams. I've taken, I've gone through the process of having to take a certification exam three times before I passed it. This is not an unusual thing, Amy. All of us go through this. Um, and it's really a challenge sometimes, especially with certain exams that you just, it seems like you just can't figure it out and, and get those out there. Uh, I will say, though, that this is from earlier on in the study group. This exam, both the 1101 and 1102, are scheduled to retire in November of 2025 or somewhere around there. So you've got plenty of time. Uh, you can take these exams over and over and over again. There's obviously at that at this point where you are, there is a two week interval. You have to wait between taking the exam again, but you can just keep taking them. Just because you've already passed the 1101 doesn't mean that the clock is ticking or that you only have a certain amount of time to take the 1102. You have until the entire exam series is retired late in 2025. So plenty of time to get certified. You absolutely do. Your 1101, you passed it, you're good. 
on the 1101. You never have to take the 1101 again. That That's locked in. You now just need to focus on the 1102 and pass that 1102. That's your goal. And as long as you can do that before November of 2025, you're fine. Now, what if you, you took your 1101, you passed it, but then November 2025 came, the entire exam series was retired, and now we're at the 1201 and 1202, whatever they call the next version of the exams. Well, if that happens, you have to restart. So although there is a bit of time now, eventually you will run out of time in November of 2025. They clean the slate, and now you have to start over again. Don't put yourself in that position. You've got all the resources in the world available to you. We've got everything on our site, all of our videos. Our Discord is there. There are a lot of smart people in our Discord that are studying for their Core 2 right now. Go talk to them. Ask them about the questions you have. Ask them about the challenges you've seen in the exam, and they'll give you some ideas of things you can do to learn a little bit more and get that 1102 exam passed and earn your A-plus certification. Chad asks similar questions since we're talking about different versions of the exam. I'm writing my Core 2 exam on the 16th of November. Will I be able to finish my your YouTube course, my YouTube course, of the objectives before then? Well, I don't know. I mean, the objectives themselves for Core 2 um, there's there's a lot in the objectives. If I go, well, let's let me see. Let's pull this up. So in the objectives for core two, uh, I'm going to look at them on my screen and get get an idea of what these are. Fortunately, I have the objectives straight up. Or did I did I close them already? Well, we can load them up again uh, on Google Sheets. Um, then I'll look at the objectives because the entire video index for core two. If I look at that Core 2 video index, they are about 9 hours and 30 minutes. Technically, 9 hours, 33 minutes, and 53 seconds. You could watch all of them in a day. But it's not about watching the videos, is it? It's about understanding what's in the videos is the most, most important part. So I would really recommend you get the exam objectives, you use those objectives as a checklist, and you just start going through the list, watching the videos, and if you can watch a video and then explain to yourself what that bullet was referring to, or explain to a third party who will soon be tired of listening to you what that bullet refers to, then you will be able to check that off your list. You can go to the next one. So it's really not much about time because nine hours and 30 minutes, you technically could do in a day. I really don't recommend that, of course but you technically could do that in a day. Um, but you've got, you got a week or so, right? It's on the 16th of November. As we sit here today, today is the 9th. So you've got some time. And you could maybe a week through here. Now, if you've never studied for this exam and you said, I'm just starting now on this exam, I will tell you that the average for most people is that it takes somewhere around two to three months to study for this exam. So unless you already have a lot of experience in the industry, you're probably not going to be able to get this done in a week. Now, fortunately, if you are, what is it, 48 hours before, I think it is, is it 24 or 48 to reschedule your exam? It's one of those two. You can reschedule your exam and just keep pushing it out. Now, you can't push it out any farther than the expiration of the voucher that you're using or I think an, a year from when you first registered. But you do have a way that you could, if you're you're getting close to that week and you're thinking, I need another week, you can push it out another week. You can push it out another month. So you have some flexibility with the timing. Now make sure, and I'll tell you, for people that are listening, if you're planning to reschedule, always confirm the rescheduling. After you reschedule, log back, log out, log back in, check to see that the rescheduling went through. Not everyone is finding the rescheduling process to be automatic or they're missing a step somewhere and not realizing it, and it doesn't get rescheduled. And then their date goes by, they, they didn't attend, they didn't make the sitting for the exam, and now all the money they spent on that exam sitting is gone because they do not reschedule it for you after that point. So always, always, always confirm your rescheduling. Always, always, always. 
confirm any rescheduling that you're doing so that you don't lose that money. It's going to be an important one. It's such a simple thing to do. It's it hurts whenever somebody comes to me and says, well, I rescheduled, but really I didn't. And the date came and now I, I show up and they won't give me my money back. I go, yeah, they don't. That's a, that's a painful one. So uh, if you've only got a week, I don't think a week is long enough. But if you've already been in the industry for a little while, it may not be a big problem for you. There are people that go through these Go through a week, but they've already been working in this industry a while. So it's not a big deal to make that happen. we got some time, so let's uh, keep going through this list and see what other things we might have. Uh, you can always, of course, submit your questions to the study group. It is also in vvox.app. You can use that ID 155-928-224 to submit your questions, or you can submit them using professormesser.com slash QA. There's a link right at the top of the screen with a couple of uh, QA boxes there. You can submit your question in all of these. OK, um, let's see one of the things that we do. Um, this is, here's an interesting one. We're going to talk about this one, because this kind of goes into once you get your certification, you're going to be asked questions like this. Alpha asks, I'm in a company with blind people needing to use Microsoft Authenticator on a PC and iPhone. It's an issue for some to authenticate on the phone with the two new two digits entering on time. That's a problem if you can see it's difficult to do that on time. Phone call, SMS are not preferred. Good. That's probably not very secure ways to do multi-factor authentication. And Windows Hello is off by policy. Again, probably a pretty good idea. We're going to try YubiKeys now. What are your thoughts on such an issue? YubiKeys is not a bad idea. Actually, it's one where you're carrying around the certificate on a key, a USB key. And to authenticate, you plug in that key, which has your certificate. You're the only one who has that certificate. It's a private key for those of you that have been through that part of Security Plus. But it, and sometimes it asks you for maybe a PIN to go along with it, a personal identification number. So you plug in the UB key, put in your four-digit PIN, which should be relatively easy to do for many people, depending uh, on, on what you're doing and the type of system you have. But that I would probably bet that it's a little bit easier. Could you imagine having uh, an issue with sight and then having an authenticator on your phone? Do I have the Microsoft authenticator? I don't want to do that. I don't want to show my authenticator. But let's say you have the authenticator on your phone and you don't have a way to see it. It has to, it has to tell you what the number is. And then you have to type that in on your computer that you also cannot see and make sure that you're able to do that before the 30 second renewal time frame comes up. Now, in reality, there are a couple ways to approach this. Depending on the multi factor authentication that you're using, Alpha, there may be a way for the administrators of your system to allow numbers that are slightly older. So in fact, many multi-factor authentication systems work this way. You may have seen this. You may have been in a case where you're putting in your multi-factor authentication code from your phone and it expires, but you got it in like two seconds after it expired or five seconds after it expired, but it still worked. Well, wait, it, it, it was five seconds later and it still worked. Yes, because the default for many of these is to allow the last number and the current number to be valid. So that's another thing that's a, that's useful. Now, this may be a good use case, though, to have your administrator go back another time, give yourself another 30 seconds, accept not only the most recent value, but any of the previous two. That can be done with many of these multi-factor authentication systems. And it may be a good fix instead of everybody now moving over to YubiKeys, and now you got to purchase the key, and now you keep up with the key, and... That may not be practical. There's a lot of downsides to that as well. It may solve your problem, but there's other problems it may bring. And if everybody already has a phone and they already have the authenticator, but the only issue is that it's timing out, what if it just didn't time out anymore? Or at least it gave you another minute, uh, gave you another two, two times through there. That may be all you need. So there are ways to kind of adjust these things. I think YubiKeys would also work, but as I mentioned, not everything is a panacea. There are always advantages and disadvantages to every implementation. And YubiKeys have their own set of disadvantages. You lose the key, what do you do? Now I've got to buy another key. It's a physical key. There's a cost associated with it. Whereas the, the app that's on your phone didn't cost you anything. Well, I mean, the phone cost you something, obviously. But we got to have the phone anyway, because if we didn't have the phone, 
we wouldn't be able to breathe. <laughs> so hopefully that's giving you some ideas, Alpha. There's there's other things that can be done, uh, but I think uh, Microsoft, it, Microsoft generally as a company has done a very good job with creating accessible applications and systems. They really have. Uh, very impressive what they've done on the Xbox side. It's impressive what they've done in Windows 11 and Windows 10. Um, so this may be a time when you may want to interact with product managers over on the accessibility side and talk about the authenticator. Maybe you have some ideas about what would make the authenticator easier to use for someone who is sight impaired. That may be a third way to approach this. Obviously, that's not a short-term fix. It may not be a fix at all, but it may allow you to set up a conversation with folks at Microsoft who have the ability to make these changes, but just don't have any good feedback. And maybe that's something you can get involved with as well. Hopefully, that's giving you some ideas. Maybe there's other ideas I didn't think of that might apply here. Uh, feel free to to slide those over my way too. Or if you have a uh, Want to talk about it more in our Discord? That's a great place to go if other people want to discuss some of those. But I think I think you've got the idea of some things that might help you and some of the things you can do immediately, some of the things you can do later, and then there might be a long-term strategy for this as well. Uh, let's talk to Waffle. Hey, Waffle. Um, Waffle, um, who I'm assume has got to be in a relationship with Chicken, uh, says, can you give us a tour of your streamer setup? I, I really should do something that would provide that. It's it's quite a setup. It's quite a thing. There's a lot of moving parts here. There's a lot going on on this desk right now. Um, and everything is here on this desk. Now, one of the things that I've done most recently is I brought all of this technology onto one platform, not, not software platform or hardware platform, but wooden platform. Uh, that's my desk. So I have a 19-inch rack. Here we go. I'm not going to give a full tour here, but I, I really should make, uh, I'm planning to make some changes to the studio. And when I make those changes over the coming months, I do plan on doing a video. But this has a 19-inch rack on this side, has a 19-inch rack on this side. Not much in there, but the, but dust. I need to dust that out pretty, pretty well. This is the reason I don't do a a tour right now. It's so dusty. I uh, got to clean it out before I show it to you. The family's coming over. Hide everything under the bed. That's all I can say. Uh, so there's a lot on here, but let me give you a quick overview. So streaming these days is exceptionally easy. You don't need this to be able to stream. You can literally do it from your phone. But of course, I want it to look good. You can't see the lights that are up here. You can kind of see that there is a light that's on my hand here. Uh, so there are lights. It just doesn't look like it in this view, but there are lights. There's also lights behind me that are that are pointing at uh, at the background. So it, it's very dark in front of me. There's plenty of light behind me and on me. So it's designed that way. I needed, um, and if you work with anybody who does video, I need a way so that every time I walk into this room, it's exactly the same light. And normally I have shades and windows and doors here and I can open those shades up and there's plenty of sunlight coming into this room. Uh, it's just during a live stream, you don't see it that way. If you look at the screens, we'll just do the screens for now. And we've done this before. So I think some of you have probably seen this. So I apologize if, if you've seen this. Far left, this big monitor up here is the one showing me the current status of the stream. This is a black magic streaming system. It's a box. It's literally a piece of hardware. And that's the video output from the hardware. The hardware itself, in fact, you can kind of see it down here. Uh, you can kind of see on this system, there's a tiny little screen. You can almost see the red part there that shows the on uh, the live view. And you kind of get an idea. That's the box that I'm looking at here. So it goes from a one inch screen to a 27 inch screen. Uh, that gives me an idea of the data rates. And more importantly, this caching number, which says 3%, that tells me the network is up. That tells me that you're able to see me. If that number started creeping up, and went to 4, 5, 10, 20, the network is down. There's a, a disconnect between me and YouTube. This is the signal that I'm sending to YouTube. So I'm only sending one video signal to YouTube. It is a 1080p HD signal. It is not 4K. I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, but I'm sending that one video stream to YouTube. YouTube gets the video stream. They then re-render it into different formats. 
So they'll re-render it into a 1080p format, a 720p format, a 360, a 240, uh, or whatever format works best on whatever you're watching it on. If you're watching it on a phone, you could probably just watch on 720. So they'll make adjustments to give you a lower quality stream that you won't even notice it's lower quality, but it saves bandwidth that way. Uh, that is what I'm sending out to YouTube. So there's a lot that, that's going on there. Um, that view on YouTube happens very quickly. So from the time they receive this video until the time you're watching it is about five to seven seconds. It's very fast in the world of video. So that's after they reformat it. They're re-rendering this, and you see it very, very quickly. That's why I don't send 4K. I have the ability in this system, and I record everything I do in 4K. You've noticed all the videos I put out over the last number of years have all been 4K videos. I certainly have the ability to stream in 4K. Not a problem. The issue, though, is that 4K is effectively four times the information as HD. It, it, it's a big difference. It's like sending four HD signals out. Well, it takes five seconds, five to seven seconds to render HD. It takes about 20 to 25 seconds to re-render 4K. And we're doing an interactive live stream where I am asking you questions and hoping that you will respond. Imagine if I asked the question and you didn't even see the question until 30 seconds after I asked it. There would be a lot more of me, so what about the weather there? Isn't this question hard? I have to kind of fill in 30 seconds somewhere uh, to, be, to be able to do that. So that's, that's the real challenge, and that's why I only send this currently in 1080p. Now, as the technologies get better and the streaming gets better and the re-rendering and the CPUs and the processing gets better, I'll be able to bump this up to 4K at that point. But at the current time, we do HD streaming because it's faster. Uh, next to me here, this is the output of my video switcher. The video switcher is this one device sitting in front of you. It is a, also a Blackmagic product. It is, I think they call their studio, 4K studio or something like that. It's It's got a long name that I don't remember. And it's not on the front of this. This just says Blackmagic Design. But is their 4K self-contained video switching system and it connects to my camera that's in front. It connects to the bird cam that you're seeing me on now. Hey, bird cam. Hey, how you doing? So that's the bird cam I have up there. Um, it has uh, inputs from all of my computers. And one of the computers is here. These two monitors here are my Mac Studio. So it is, that's one set of video. Another set of video is coming from this laptop, this MacBook here that's showing the presentation. Uh, and then, of course, I have the camera in front of me. I think I already mentioned you know, that video switching is there. And I switch back and forth between all of them with these buttons that are in front of me. So that is, that's effectively the streaming setup. The audio itself is a HAL microphone and a PR40 and this, uh, this audio mixer from Axia. Is, is what I have in front of me. You can you hardly see it. It's right there. That's the, the audio uh, system there. Um, it, is a, it is effectively a, a, a packet, packetized audio mixer. So it's not an, it's, some parts of it are analog, obviously, because I'm talking to it and you're hearing me, but everything inside of this is done digitally. So it's kind of nice to be able to have that. So uh, all of this works together. To make this happen some of it is a little bit overkill some of it i bought not knowing what we would do with it and we kind of grew into it which is great when that happens um and all of this though is documented on my website on my main page of the website is an overview of the studio it's a link that's there at the bottom or you can simply go to professormaster.com studio where i have more links to the exact mixer model and the exact video switching model and the type of speakers i'm using and the camera that's in front of me which is now it's an old camera, but still 4K, and it works great. Uh, I've got everything that's on, that hopefully everything you see here, including the keyboard and mouse, is documented, uh, and all of that. All of that is up to date, including the Blackmagic equipment, because I rarely swap that stuff out. Uh, rarely, rarely. Let's look and see. I'm going to, let's bring it up on the screen here, get to look over my shoulder as we go to uh, ProfessorMesser.com. And at ProfessorMesser.com, bring up the screen. There we go. And on here, uh, at the bottom is the Professor Messer Studio. I'm going to click on that, and I get an ad from Google. Thanks, Google. I mean, thanks, but not thanks. Uh, I think we all feel the same way uh, for that. And here's the Professor Messer Studio. 
So the professor, let's, let's, let's scroll through this and see what's here. So on this is the, the mic. That is the mic I'm using, the House Sound PR40. So that's my studio. That's the mic. Uh, there's the camera. Kind of outdated at this point. I need a new camera, everybody. Why Why not? We, it's like a boat. We just keep throwing money into it. Uh, it's a Lumix GH5S. It's a 4K camera. It, it really doesn't do camera. It really just does video and usually just sits there. It never moves. Uh, and it's been a fabulous camera to be able to use. I have different ideas of what I want to do for 4K. But at the time, this was just phenomenal. Um, single lens, mirrorless, uh, just a great camera. It's now outdated, and I need to update it. Video switcher, that is what I'm using, the Blackmagic Design ATEM Television Studio Pro 4K. I'm looking to upgrade that as well. That's a big upgrade. That's a $5,000 upgrade, and I'm not I'm not sure my, my wallet wants me to do that right now. We'll figure it out. And there's the audio mixer, the Axio QOR.16 integrated console engine and Radius 8 fader AIOP mixing console. There it is. That's mine. And then we've got the other things. I do have in-ear monitors that I'm using right now. They're in my ear. You just can't see them because the camera's on the other side. Speakers that I'm listening through uh, when I'm not listening into my in-ear monitors. Uh, the video recorders, those are the Cylons that I always mention, which are Blackmagic HyperDeck Studio 12Gs, which also need to be upgraded. There's all these upgrades. It's always an upgrade. Smart View 4K, I'm not using. So we can take that off the list. No longer using that monitor. Uh, the Burkham camera is accurate. The key lights are accurate. The Logitech keyboard is accurate. The mouse is accurate. And then there's the Blackmagic Design Web Presenter 4K. That's the streaming box that I mentioned earlier that is up there. Whew. Okay. There's the studio. So that gives you an update on things. So as I say that, I want to be able to do an updated studio config because I'm planning to replace the video switcher here over the next number of months. Uh, I have many ideas of what I want to replace it with, probably the more updated Black Magic ones. I have to do more research and make sure it's what I have there. It would solve a lot of problems that I have during the live stream with a lot of button pushing I do and a lot of overlays that I have. And you've probably seen whenever I've been going back and forth to certain screens that I will, I will manually jump around the screen like this. That's me manually having to move because VVox has to put my face in a different place to see everything. There, there are ways to do this where I can simply go to the VVox screen and I'm automatically in the right place. This particular mixer or video switcher I have today doesn't allow me to do that. Uh, it's it's kind of old in those terms. It was uh, one of those where once you buy technology, it just gets older. It gets older and older and older, and that's, that's kind of how that works out. For those of you in the chat room asking about the presentations themselves, if you go to the YouTube channel, everything you're looking there that is not a live stream is in 4K. So everything that we produce here is in 4K, um, except for the live events. Although the screens that you're looking at, that I'm looking at, and the presentations that I'm creating, and the video in the room is 4K. Um, I just send it out as 1080p. So that's the only difference. Um, it's just so much easier if you just have everything at the same resolution. Although the Blackmagic equipment is very good at at putting a, a single video, uh, multiple video inputs into a single format. It will do a lot of work for you uh, to be able to make that happen. And just like that, there goes the cache. There goes the stream lag that we were mentioning earlier. Well, top of the hour. So we did pretty well there. We'll have to figure out how, how well the, the stream goes at that point. I have a feeling somebody ran over the cable, which is probably not unusual. That happens from time to time. And it does happen on... We've had it happen again uh, on YouTube, of course, to have that particular problem with the stream and being able to break these things down, too. Whenever I start looking at uh, challenges with, uh, with streaming, that, that is the biggest one is connectivity. So uh, we'll have to wait for it to come back. Um, these are usually pretty quick. It may not be, though. One of the things that you may not know, well, things you don't know, is this, the connectivity that we have to the internet is done through links through our neighborhoods, through the streets themselves. And on these streams, one of the things that has happened in my particular area, the last mile, they call it, in the world of wide area networks, is that someone cut 
the cable modem connection, the cable in the ground was cut by the city. They were replacing some water meters and they cut through the cable. Well, the cable's on one side of the street, but it connects to boxes on the other side of the street. They literally ran the cable across the street and put a protector across the cable. And they did that. Now we have to keep going up and pushing the protectors back together because the protectors keep coming apart and people start driving, which was. Um, so it's very possible that they are now finally replacing that cable and the downtime is related to that. It could be that someone just dropped cracked. Maybe the cable. We don't know. I see the cash is slowly coming up. It's slowly going down. So some of the is going out is at a relatively good speed at this point. But that's not too incredibly unusual for something like that. What I was trying to do is, is stall enough so that the stream would come back up again and be able to work through it. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's going to be the case because we are at the top of the hour. This is usually the sign-off point, but I just wanted to have a chance to tell everybody in the chat room that I appreciated them being here and that this was one of those uh, study groups that were went so well. Everybody on the study group did so great in the first hour. I'm going to have to make harder questions. And your questions in the second hour were also phenomenal. Such a great set of questions. Hopefully, uh, since we are recording locally, outages with the internet don't matter. You'll still be able to watch the updated view. What you probably won't have on the replay is the ability to see the chat, which is, that's okay. That's not a, not a deal breaker. It's not something I like, but it's something that is there. And hopefully that can that can get you to where you need to go. But that kind of covers what we were working through. Hopefully, that's given you some perspective of things you need to work on for your core two studies. I think that's usually where, if you're in the process of studying for core two, there's a lot to go through. Make sure you get your hands on those exam objectives. Again, we do one of these study groups every month. If uh, you're someone who is working on your core two, come back for the latest one. You can always find out when the next event is going to be by going to our calendar, Professor Messer calendar or click the events link link at the top of the professor messer website well with that and the outage and everything else this is probably a perfect time to end this particular stream thank you so much for being